Okay. Um, without further ado, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. If we could go, just because this is the order you are on my screen, um, we'll go Kate, Roger, Bex, if that's all right. So Kate, if you want to say hello and um, introduce yourself. Sure. Oh, oh hi, kids. How are you guys? Additional panelists. Today. <laughs> Additional panelists. <laughs> I'm Kate Williams. I'm the Senior Managing Editor at GIA. Happy to be here, and I think it's about time I learned how to draw some boundaries and get some balance in my life, so I'm glad these experts are joining us. Roger? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go get the expert to come in and help with that. <laughs> um, I'm Roger Holland. I'm a teaching assistant professor at the University of Denver in the Lamont School of Music also liturgical consultant for the Office of Black Ministry in the Archdiocese of New York. Uh, do the math, yeah, New York, Denver, uh, but I'm also <laughs> the director of the Spirituals Project housed in the Lamont School of Music at the University of Denver. Great, Bex. I'm Bex Scott and I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota. I work as a liturgist and director of music at St. Catherine University. Wonderful. That's that's. Thank you all for being here. Really, truly, this is going to be um, such a fruitful conversation. Again, those of you who have just joined us, if you have a question you'd like to submit, you can use the Q and A feature at the bottom. Um, so, so let's begin. I mean, if we think about um, this topic of you know finding balance, especially for people who are in pastoral ministry, um, let's start by just talking about why this is important to discuss. I mean, I think uh, it's no secret for those in ministry, those teaching, those in education, that um, it is difficult to maintain a balance between work life, personal life, um, at the best of times, and then 2020 and COVID happened, right? Um, so so let's, let's just begin there. Um, why, why is this issue something that, you know, is so important, so elusive for people in ministry? Why are we bad at this? I'll start then. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things, and it's probably the people that are the most dedicated, that have the most difficulty with balance. Why? Because we are so dedicated to the ministry that we have committed to. We, we feel called to give, to serve, to help. And the danger comes where we don't have a cutoff valve for that where we are constantly giving, when we're constantly outpouring, and it's, it comes from a place of unselfishness, which is awesome. That's what we want. That's, if we follow the model of Jesus, that's what he did, right? He poured himself out as an offering, as a sacrifice, right, for all of us. Um, but right there, let me pause and say, none of us are Jesus. <laughs> so we're not pouring ourselves out as a sacrifice for the whole world, nor should we. Uh, so the, the, the issue, I guess, or the challenge becomes, where do we find balance with that? And we have to come to the place and the understanding that if we are continuously pouring out without pouring back in, as Matt said earlier, then you're pouring from an empty cup. So that means we have to find moments of rest. Even And, and let's go back to that uh, uh, model of Jesus. Even Jesus took time for rest, right? He took time to replenish. He, there were the multiple instances in the scriptures where he came, he moved away from, from the, not only the disciples, but from those crowds where he could become, you know, in, be in solitude. The 40 days where he fasted and prayed in the desert before he began his public ministry. The time that he took before what we recognize now as Holy Week, he took time. So it's always important for time. And for those of us who are music ministers, I saw a wonderful sermon recently. I think it was from the Alfred Street uh, Baptist Church. And uh, the pastor preached a sermon on a term that we find in the Psalms that has no definitive uh, uh, um, uh, with translation, Selah. We know that in the Psalms, when we see Selah, many scholars think that that means pause. You take a pause. Some felt that it was uh, an instruction for the minstrel, for the musician to do a musical interlude. But at some point, we understand that there needs to be a pause. Even as singers, you don't sing continuously. You have to take a moment to breathe, right? So we're not organs. We are human beings. We are finite. There must be moments of pause. So take advantage of that thing in the score that says rest. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God, Roger, you could do this whole webinar. <laughs> Um, I, I really struggle with this. And I think it's funny that every single person that we asked to do this webinar with us um, said, um, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, it's funny because Diana joked about, you know, saying no to this webinar because she felt like she was so bad at it. And I was like, oh, well, Diana, that's, that's a good boundary you just drew for yourself. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I try, I try to figure that out. And I think it's kind of a daily assessment. I haven't quite read this book yet, but I've uh, uh, been flipping through it when I can. Uh, it's called Boundaries by uh, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. And I was just going to read this little paragraph that's on the back cover of the book because I think it helps us. Um, it, it names some of the things that, that Roger named too and that we're all feeling. It says, people often focus so much on being loving and giving that they forget their own limits. Have you ever found yourself wondering, can I say no and still be a loving person? How do I answer someone who wants my time, love, energy, or money? How do I stand up to hurtful behavior or abuse? How do I feel guilty when I consider setting boundaries? Uh, I definitely do. <laughs> I definitely do feel guilty. Um, but I was thinking too, and you know, if Bex, you want to jump in here, uh, please do. But I was just going to help us to situate the conversation and you know, why I think it's important for us to have this conversation now um, is because like Roger said, we're all at home. There's a global pandemic in case we didn't get that memo. Oh, Maria, it's called, it's just called Boundaries. Um, it's on the New York Times bestseller list. So you'll probably, it'll probably come up right away. Um, we're all at home. There's a global pandemic. We're all like a lot of us have either been furloughed or lost our jobs, or we're having to really reimagine what our jobs mean as we try to have these worship services over uh, virtual means. Um, but also, I think our our nation has also felt the weight of yet another trauma after the murder of George Floyd, and we're all saying, "Okay, well this this." This is, there's a lot going on right now, but we can't wait anymore. We need to amp up this conversation. We need to be all in. It needs to be all the time. We can't be okay with just these, you know, millimeter movements on the, um, the scale of progress. We have to have more progress. It has to be sooner. So a lot of people have taken that on. And I know a lot of um, my uh, friends who are people of color have said like, I'm exhausted talking about this. Like, this isn't a new thing for me. I've been dealing with this my whole life and now y'all want me to talk about it all the time. <laughs> you know, well, you all want me to help figure out the solution to the problem that y'all made. Um, and then on top of that, our, our church, our company, our GIA family is dealing with the stresses of learning that we have, um, we have a huge problem with, um, I, I, I'm not going to reduce it just to a sexual assault um, issue, but an overall issue of power and control that we are trying to figure out um, how we got to where we are and how we can not be like that anymore. Um, so I was thinking of, you know, even how many times I, you know, Roger, I have reached out to you <laughs> in the last uh, couple of months here. Um, and like, I'm so thankful that you've always been willing to, to be a conversation partner with me. And at the same time, I'm like, he's probably exhausted. Like, how can I ask him to have this conversation again and again? Um, and then there was a situation, you know, Bex, when, when you were invited to be a part of a women's retreat and, um, the date was changed without your consent and you had to make a really tough decision to say, actually, I can't be a part of that anymore. And it, and it brought up a lot of feelings, I think, um, for, for you about like, am I passing up this opportunity that has been given to me in a way that is, that prohibits me from having other opportunities. And so I thought it was important for us to have this conversation. It's a lot of me talking, so I'll stop talking now. But I thought those were two really key reasons why it's important for us to have this conversation right now. Yeah, I, I'll jump in um, with that. Thank you, Kate, for 
for giving some of that background about um, partially why <laughs> we were asked to do this when we wouldn't necessarily, um, I will say, speak for myself, when I wouldn't necessarily say I should be the spokesperson for what healthy boundaries look like. I'm certainly um, on a quest to learn about it. And um, I'm definitely someone who spends a lot of time analyzing why didn't that work for me or why didn't that work um, or what could have been better in these um, professional and personal situations where boundaries keep popping up as an issue and um, and there you're right there are a lot of feelings that come up and I think those are the things that give us insight to where we need to start thinking about boundaries so especially like um, any kind of feeling of resentment um, is a, instead of being like, oh no, I'm resentful, it, I've learned that it can be a really helpful, um, like learning feeling of pause. Let's see if this can help you to identify and to articulate and communicate um, a better and healthier boundary. Um, and, and that creates a better culture for others to have healthy boundaries too. And so thinking about it as um, not a selfish thing, but something that really can make a difference and have effect on others. Yeah, you know, I wanna jump in right there, um, Bex and, and Kate from something you both have just said. And it, it made me think about a time in my life where I had to make some choices. There was a time where I had about five or six different jobs that I was doing at the same time. I was working for the Boys Choir of Harlem full-time. Um, I had my church gig. We, you know, musicians, we talk about these gigs, but I was doing my church job. Um, I think I might've had two church jobs at one point at the same time, but I was working in the church as a director of music. I took a position as the director of the Youth Gospel Choir for the Queen Symphony Orchestra. I was singing with a jazz group uh, at a jazz musician by the name of James Williams in the ICU. And I was singing in an R&B band that did mostly weddings, but some corporate gigs. Uh, and I think at one point I even had my own little side gospel group. So I was doing all of this and just going from one thing to the other. And certainly at that, it was very exciting because I was like all these, you know, little pots and all these little various you know, aspects and music making. But at a certain point in, in many of those, I came to this thought and it started with one in particular. If some, is this thing, and this was the question for me, is this bringing me joy? Is this life giving? What is this feeding into my life and how do I benefit from it? And I started um, exiting from a number of those things based on that criteria. If it wasn't life-giving, and, and in all our relationships, not even the professional ones, but our personal ones, if this relationship doesn't feed into me, if I don't get anything from it, then it is life. If it's not life-giving, it is life-sucking. It is taking <laughs> away. It's got to be one or the other. And so I started cutting things based on whether it was bringing me joy or if it was life-giving. And I think that can be one of the criteria by which we can set boundaries, you know, and especially in a situation where I was really doing just too much. Um, it was exciting. I had the energy at that time to do that. But, you know, at a certain point, you have to ask these questions. I, I like what you said, because I do the same thing, Bex. You know, I'm, I'm very self-analytical. I, I, I reflect on stuff in before, during, and after. What was good about that? What wasn't? What could I have done better? What could, you know, how can I improve upon the situation for the next time? And I, for me, that was very important. And then Kate, you were mentioning some of these, you know, in this time of COVID and Black Lives Matter and people coming to you. And a lot of folks have come to me asking me to speak about or write about appropriation. And I've written actually a couple of articles about it and one, one person asked me to write again, and I said, you know what, I've actually already written about it, and here's the article. Um, but then recently, actually, just a few days ago, a different perspective came to me, and I talked with a couple of my scholar colleagues about it, because I, I, was, I would like to do the article for this person, but I have a, now a different perspective 
on the article. And so for me, it is, uh, I want to write about what I want to write about. And that is encouraging. That is what is giving me um, inspiration. So rather than one more time write about appropriation, you know, for folks outside of a particular culture, which is a, an important conversation, but I don't want to keep having the same conversation. So if I've written about it once or twice, I don't want to write about it three, four, five more times. You know, I, I'm, I'm just tired of that. But if there's another perspective, if there's another way to approach this, and I'm going to hold on to what that is that I came up with until the article comes down. But, but you know, uh, I think that for me. So again, I'm making choices. I'm making decisions. What is life giving? What do I actually want to do? And what do I have time for? You know? Yeah. 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 What you were describing just was you like took me back to a like very visceral time of my early career in life. And I thank you for outlining that where you were describing going from one gig to the other and all these different things and the excitement of it and the feelings and, um, and ultimately kind of what it led you to um, think about and the choices it made to you. And I have to pause because for a moment I was like, oh my gosh, he Marie kondo his life. <laughs> Does this bring me joy? Sorry, I had to. I just was like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> but that's true. That's that's really that's really it. And I think um, realizing that we're on autopilot or we're just chasing one thing after another in, in this um, culture of busyness and and well um, this hustle mindset. Um, make us lose our own voice um, and lose our own ability to hear our voice. Um, and I think that that was the part, the time that I can relate to in my life when I was um, doing a hundred different things. I was touring with a bluegrass group and um, there was a big moment where I just, I, I realized like, you know, what am I doing f for my song too? You know, as like someone who said for years, like I love to write and I love to do these creative things. And um, it wasn't that I didn't like to play and sing other people's songs, I did. Um, but suddenly when I, I also started identifying like, what were these people and groups giving back to me and realizing I was just pouring, pouring, pouring. Um, and when I started to weed those things out and allow for other time, it was really scary. And I was even told by some friends and family members, well, you're really losing out on this opportunity. Well, they won a Grammy. Well, they did this and they did that. Um, you know, like they could do a lot more for you. And ultimately listening to my own voice and freeing up that energy wasn't about freeing up time. It was about freeing up space to hear my own voice. And it didn't take but really a few weeks and months before suddenly I was able to start writing a lot more of my own music and, and just feeling this freedom of, of following my own path. Well, that's great. I mean, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Bex. I mean, and, and for what you offered, Roger, too. I mean, it, I'm struck by the, the, the watchword that we come back to a lot in the conversations we've been having so far in the series is discernment, right? And it seems like the, I don't know that there's anybody on the conversation now or anybody who's worked in, in ministry who doesn't get when they are retold, you know, something's either life-giving or life-sucking, right? I think like we get that and it's so helpful to hear it again. And it's helpful to, to re, you know, reground myself in that. And then where I always fall down again is in the, um, the, the understanding, what's my responsibility? Even if I know, okay, this is going to take more for me. This is me sacrificing, et cetera. How do I discern when that sacrifice is worth making or not? When do I discern um, between life-giving, life-sucking, or if there's a, a, a measure to be given when to give it? How, how have any of the three of you thought through this discernment, or maybe you have an example of, of going through that process? I can give an example. Um, I'll jump in. And first I'll start with this, is that I found myself in those 
big moments of conflict or uncertainty or feeling burnt out, realizing that part of what led me there was not realizing way back in the small things, the power of my no or the power of setting boundaries. So, um, so I, I really want to emphasize that that it's not, you don't want to wait for, I don't, I want to wait anymore for those big moments to start to do it. Sometimes you realize like, oh man, I really needed to set some a long time ago, but the, it's really in the small moments. It's really in those moments of like, um, I just got asked to do this thing last minute. And, um, and the conversation you have with your boss or the conversation you have with your, with your coworker in that moment for that little thing. And so, um, it's not that now I'm like, every time I hear something last minute, I'm like, no, it's just that in those moments now I'm like, so let's talk about the expectations and how this is difficult and how, if I'm going to do this now, it doesn't mean, and I don't want to set the expectation that I'm going to be able to, to do this again in the future. Um, and to say that without just being like, yes, 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 because I want, you know, to feel like this savior to someone, um, mm -hmm. does that help? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, the Bible says, I just had to look at, make sure I had it right in Proverbs, <laughs> <laughs> the people perish for lack of knowledge or where there is no vision. Um, at my university, we, we've been setting forth a plan for what it, what it is we hope to be, what, what is our vision, what is our philosophy, and what are the pillars that are exemplary and, and the, the, land, the, the, the things that will help us to focus and get us to that vision. And especially during this time of COVID where universities are having to make priorities, cut uh, 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 you know, budgets and so forth, the things that don't align with the university's vision are the first things that go. Mm -hmm. And so for us, I would like to offer that helping to discern can start with having a plan. You know, what is the, the plan for this ministry? And what are the steps? What are the things that are going to help you achieve your goals in this ministry? So if the things do not align um, with what the goals for the ministry, with the mission, a mission statement, if they don't align with your mission and your goals, then those are the things that can afford to take a back seat or maybe don't need, need to be there at all. Mm -hmm. And then certainly, as we're putting this in a ministry context, there is prayer. We should always be praying about these things and, and ask for the Holy Spirit to grant us discernment, you know, um, and that I think can help us as we're trying to decide where do I draw boundaries? How do I discern what I should do and what I shouldn't do? How much I should give and not give? Well, if it doesn't fit with your mission, if it doesn't fit with your goal, um, and if you have not heard uh, from God on this, then maybe that's not the goal. Mm. Yeah, I'm really glad, Roger, that you grounded us off right at the get-go with um, examples of how Jesus took a break. <laughs> um, because if we're trying to, you know, imitate that life, and let's not leave that part out. Um, and I wanted to mention, too, that I think maybe especially for women, but maybe for all of us, the, 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 the prime example of holiness for a woman is... Mary, right? The mother of God. And the thing we know about Mary is that she said yes. And I think that baits us into thinking that our job as disciples or as people who want to, uh, you know, aspire to carry divinity within them too, um, should just say yes. <laughs> they should say yes all the time. Like, yes, yes, yes. Cause we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe if I say yes, some, some miracle will happen. It'll be the thing I, I didn't know I needed. Um, and I don't think we spend enough time actually practicing or rehearsing or remembering all the things that Mary had to say no to along the way so that she could say yes to that thing. That was the right thing. So she said, yes, to carrying um, the son of God in her womb, but she said no 
to any semblance of you know normative life for her at that time she said no to her um her spouse or spouse to be for them being able to have a, a marriage that um you know uh for children which was a uh, you know probably an objective that joseph had we don't know she said no to lots of stuff and i think she said no you know including to her son sometimes <laughs> You know, raising a small child at home, I know that like no is a part of the part of the regular vocab here. Like, and that's so that we can say yes to the things that are right, so that we can build a future together that is going to look more like what we what we hope or what we are discerning that the reign of God has the possibility of looking like. And so I just think it's a it's a tricky and can become a little bit of a manipulative tactic when we hear, you know, we should say yes like Mary. Yeah. I think that, I mean, in general, anything can be used as a manipulation tactic, sadly, we know this, um, but especially, um, I think any, um, and, like, these kind of situations where the, there's these models of holiness that we hold ourselves to, um, we just have to be careful. And I think you bring up a lot of good points in what you're saying um, about Mary as one of those prime models and um, it could be a whole nother uh, class and uh, webinar and year of webinars to delve into um, gender and um, and race and what um, boundaries and the idea of servitude and receptivity um, and how that affects us more, um, women and people of color, um, especially in, in ministerial roles and things like that. Um, and where prominently there are patriarchal structure, structures, that's just, we're going to see, uh, see that happen more. And so I think it's an important thing to bring up. And I think it's really, you can't really do this conversation without at least nodding to the fact that that's that's there and that is um something that certain people have to deal with in a more difficult way um every single day and who's making the coffee um in the office and um mm -hmm. and when you know i was told by someone in leadership who was a mentor of mine a number of years ago that the best part of me was my the best thing about you is you're so accommodating and how that was a really big turning point for me in realizing that I was doing something really wrong if that was the best part about me in my life um and it started having me look at those kind of things about my gender and about um what I wanted to bring to the table and that I needed to start doing something that looks like radical acts of justice by taking care of myself and by saying no and by modeling to the, this culture that needs has a long way to go that they can do the same thing. You know, in that, I'd like just to add to that, um, the role of men in this, because that's very important. It's important that, Bex, as, as you were saying what you were saying, it calls for men to honor the gifts of women. It calls for men to respect the gifts of women and to honor women's voices in our communities. Because what you talked about is something, you know, you mentioned patriarchal structures and as we're even talking right now about dismantling systemic racism, we need to dismantle these systems of sexism and gender bias. And one of the ways uh, that needs to happen and a role that needs to be stepped up to is for men to respect women more. They have to respect women more. We, sorry, I'm, we have to respect women more, which means that we've got to take a step back, that we have to stop seeing women in these antiquated gender roles, you know, as the person who makes the best coffee, when you have so much more to offer than that. Um, we need to have women in positions of authority 
and their voices in those places of, of authority and responsibility need to be respected by men. And so we have to, uh, men have to assume more responsibility for making sure that that happens. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for saying that, Roger. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, you don't have to say that, but you do. And that, that, that means a lot. And also like, just thank you for saying that out loud. <laughs> um, I, uh, thank you for saying that out loud. Um, and I, I hope everybody heard that. <laughs> well, I, and I think the thing that makes it so good to hear, especially in this context, is when we're talking about boundaries, um, sometimes it can seem like, well, this is, these are the things that I need to do because if I get hurt or if I'm taken advantage of, it was my fault because I didn't set those boundaries. And we learned that in, in our, the conversation a couple days ago, um, right, that um, was awesome that we had about um, sexual misconduct and, um, so I, I think that, again, this comes back to these, these, even these small ways of thinking sometimes in our culture, in our, even in my talking about this stuff, um, can distract from, from really what's going on, you know? Yeah. It reminded me, too, of the, that we had a little planning meeting with another webinar group uh, just right before this, and uh, Diana McAlintel said, something really beautiful it was about representation and music planning or liturgy planning and she said you know when when we don't have it and i think in this case it equates when we don't have respect of those boundaries and of one another when we don't have it we're not seeing the fullness of of god <laughs> we're limiting ourselves um, to see the fullness of god as god is present in and through you know, every gender, every race, every culture, every style. And that's not what we want to do. Um, so let's, uh, let's not limit ourselves. Um, I love that. Um, and the other thing that kind of was like resonating in my mind as you're talking is that like, I feel like as many times as we can, we should affirm for one another that it's okay to say no. And it's also okay for you to expect the people you say no to, to respect that decision. <laughs> without, without penalty, you, you don't deserve a penalty for drawing a boundary for yourself if it means that it will preserve your, your own self, um, your energy and your, the, the capacity you have to contribute to life or the, um, the topic or the institution or whatever you know, we're talking about here. They should want that for you. <laughs> I think that's that is such an important point to make, and I think it, it it underscores again the fact that in this conversation about setting boundaries and finding balance, um, ultimately it comes down to that power differential, right? And especially within ministry, we it is hard to feel as though I am able to say no. I mean, or and I'm, when I say I, I mean people in in ministry, right? All of us, um, and and it it. It feels hard to say no because I feel like I'm responsible, right? Perhaps at best, but at worst, this is that that instance of you know the evidence of the power differential that exists. If we think about ministry, why are, do we have a field or a landscape or a culture that makes it okay for someone to say no when asked to do something or invited to do something or put in a position to do something? If the answer is not really, we don't have a, a landscape that allows for people to say no or honors a no just like it honors a yes, um, then that is evidence of the power differentials that are you know, riddled throughout our structures. Um, and, it, and it becomes manipulative, especially when it becomes the, but what will we do without you? Or when it takes its fullness, fullest form, where now I echo that back and say, like the title of the webinar, what will they do without me? If I don't do this, who will? 
sometimes that can be ego. Oftentimes it's the conditioning of, I have to say yes, because, oh my God, so many people depend on me. There's a, mm -hmm. that's a evidence of the power differential that exists in the landscape. Yeah. I, and when you say no, like, that's why I have to reframe it in my mind. Mm -hmm. If these scenarios often as, all right, Bex, this is your opportunity for, to, for an act of radical justice. Um, and it's not comfortable and it's not going to make everyone happy and you're going to let people down and, you know, a myriad of other things that really suck. Um, and that's what makes this an act of radical justice is when you lead the way for not just continually being a victim of unfair expectations um, and you know that example that Kate brought up earlier about the women's retreat thing when the date was suddenly moved when suddenly there were a lot more technical technological asks fill in the blank there were a ton of things also side note there was never any mention of compensation or what that would look like for anything um, and I started I had to make the difficult decision, even though I really was looking forward to and loved the work that I did with these other women who were the other um, speakers for the event. And that was a part of it of like, oh my gosh, I'm letting them down. It's like not necessarily their fault that this happened. And, um, but ultimately I, I did the hard thing for me, which was the right thing by letting it go. And, disappointing some people. And you know, you don't always see the fruits of these experiences or um, these corrective experiences. But in this case, I, I did in the form that at least one, especially one of the other women contacted me and thanked me for identifying the areas that were not fair and just and that it really helped her to feel better because she thought she was the only one thinking these things. And, you know, I think if at the least, maybe the other women will, will think harder um, in these moments of conflict where they're asked to do things that they're not comfortable with. Yeah, you both have cited examples of um, having to make a hard choice that involves like undercompensation financially. And I think that's another, you know, kind of pitfall that a lot of us in church work tend to fall into because a lot of times we're told, well, can't you do it for Jesus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that intersection then between both music and ministry, right? People, people love music until you have to pay for it. Right. I mean, we see that with professional recordings that are, you know, shared without, you know, being purchased. We also see that with anybody who's ever been asked to play a gig. Right. Plus, then you add ministry and the joke that oftentimes we tell ourselves and perpetuate, which is no one gets into ministry for the money. Right. You know, so when you have both of those things together, that really, really compounds. And and I mean, part of this part of this and I'm, I'm thinking out loud and processing out loud here, too. Like I realize, of course, and I admit my guilt in this, like we when we talk about boundary and balance and we talk about ourselves finding balance and setting boundaries, there are all kinds of things that we can say there. And there's all kinds of psychological research about stress and how we can de-stress and be more active. That That's great. But it also puts the burden then on the people who are doing too much or being asked to do too much or not being allowed to say no, when really the emphasis needs to also be upon how do any of us in, in leadership or power, whatever that leadership or power looks like, how do we enable uh, a, or enact a system that allows for people to say no, right? As opposed to me being told you should say no more, that might be true. I also need to operate within systems that make that no okay and yeah. don't either villainize the no um, don't eat, don't punish the no by then saying, well, if you don't say yes to this, you'll not be able to, you'll never work in this town again or whatever, right? We need to find those systems and leaders. Well, self -included. <laughs> you know, right, right. And self-included need to be in a situation where we make it okay. And because what's the worst that happens? You know, if we're leaders and we invite someone to do something and they say no thoughtfully, what's the worst that happens is we need to find somebody else. I'm not equating everybody's gifts as being the same. I'm not saying one person is the same as the next, but you know, in parish ministry, 
we go to the same people over and over because they're the ones we know and we know they'll say yes. And if someone says no to helping out, then I need to get to know someone else in my community and invite their gifts. And that's not bad, right? I know I'm oversimplifying, but we need to create a structure where leadership allows for no's to be given as a response and honored, um, as opposed to us being able to as well, you know, vocalize our no's. I love that, Matt. And I think that um, as um, someone who works with students now, um, I've been in my job for a couple of years. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and how I can try to not pass on what was modeled to me necessarily um, as far as uh, unhealthy boundaries go and so there are so many situations where I'm like oh it would be really convenient if one of my students did this for me right now or if they said yes to me about this and sometimes but that's on them ultimately and so I'm I'm really trying to think very intentionally about the environment that we're creating um, especially in my position of power and leadership so that not like instead of like oh man or or you know the disappointment that i used to receive from mentors or or teachers if i had to go do another thing um for school i turn it around now and i'm not perfect at it but i i really try to take those moments when a student's like you know i really i want to do that but i also have this other thing and i'm like i'm really glad that you brought that up. Good for you. You know, like, thank you for identifying these other things in your life that are giving you life. And I want to encourage you in doing that, you know, or at least giving them the option to make that choice without any kind of judgment or repercussions. Uh, it, it, it speaks to a responsibility of leaders to lead better, to <laughs> manage their ministries, their spaces better. Bex, as you were talking, made me think about my role as a, as a professor. And uh, all of us who, who teach in the classroom have had uh, instances where there is those one or two students that are very participatory and they might suck all the energy out of the room and not allow space for others to voice their opinions. And some of them might be shy and which calls on the, the leader to do a little more to give them space, but also to support them and to encourage them. And even if they don't have the answers, to help them work through those answers. So, you know, I'm looking at the students and after, you know, one or two that have answered the majority of the questions, I start going to other people that haven't participated. And I said, well, what do you think about this? Well, I don't know. Well, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I was thinking this. Okay, well, then, then try to, you know, maybe if they're a little askew, how can I redirect them? What kind of questions can, probing questions can I ask of them or you know, to kind of get them to think a little more. And that's how, it's about engagement. So, I mean, Matt, I know we were talking also about if we say yes all the time, then that doesn't leave opportunities for others to say yes. Mm -hmm. So for those of us that find ourselves doing the majority of the work, sometimes it's important that we take a step back. Uh, think about it this way, by doing all the work, you are depriving someone else of an opportunity to help, to be a part of, and, and an opportunity to be a blessing. Yep. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, I realize that, you know, I mean, especially to, to go back to, you know, leadership, like leaders, leaders oftentimes deal in a currency of opportunity. And that, um, that can be problematic. You know, if I, as a leader, extend an opportunity, how, and you know, if I say, Bex, we'd love you to be on this um, panel talking about you know finding balance and uh, Beck says no that you know if how easy it is oftentimes when we're in a currency of opportunity to then not go back to that person right or I want to invite someone to be on a committee in my parish and they said no do do I accept that as legitimate or do I think the next time an opportunity comes up well they said no to this thing so I don't really know if they're committed right that becomes the way that oftentimes um, and, and intentionally or not. Um, the narrative becomes internalized. And I think that that is so incumbent upon leaders to realize you deal in a currency of opportunity, not just for 
career or for the ability to get your voice heard, but for that, that presence and that inclusion. And that is a huge, that's where the responsibility lies. There's a huge responsibility there when you deal with that type of currency. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I think, I think, I don't, I'm sure everyone has gone through this at some point too, but I feel, especially because some of my work has involved working with young people and also because I have a young daughter that I almost feel like, you know, in relation to this conversation now that I have a responsibility to teach her how to say no and um, gracefully recover from that no, no matter how that no is received. Um, and I think maybe just collectively as a, as a community of peoples, we could probably do a better job at, mm -hmm. at that. Um, a lot of us have to learn it ourselves while we're trying to show an example uh, for the next generation. But I, I really think that goes back to, you know, part of the core of how we got ourselves in, you know, a very contentious time. You know, it's not just about COVID. There's all this other stuff going on. And I don't know that we've handled that, that uh, ability to find balance and um, healthy boundary drawing very well as a, as a church. Um, so I hope that we can maybe that'll help. Maybe that'll help to think of it as like, it's our responsibility to show people how to say no right. and also show people how to receive a no. Yeah. Like, like maybe instead of you should learn how to say no more, we should be saying you should get better at being rejected. <laughs> sure. Well, and, and you know, what you're talking about also, again, reveals the fact that we, I mean, we, all, all of the way we experience things, we are, we are cultured to it, right? <clears throat> Meaning that we, we exist in systems that have been created and, and then manufactured and sustained and perpetuated. And, you know, I think of <clears throat> why, why is it that when we are home, I work so much more than when I go into my, my office, right? And, and, <clears throat> and so, so follow me here for a second, right? <clears throat> when we think about the the systems and the, the structures and the, the way that we've cultured ourselves to find balance or boundaries. Oftentimes it's, and I'm not discounting these, but they, they worked for me. You know, well, you know, you gotta, you know, leave your, leave your work computer at home or leave, uh, I, as a classroom instructor, you know, leave my papers I need to grade on my desk in my office at the university instead of bringing them home, right? Keep it separate, great. Um, but now instead we're finding ways within the culture of expectation to say yes and do more to try to find natural ways to resist it. I don't have the 20 minutes to decompress in the car anymore. My computer is by my bedside or it's downstairs, wherever. Like, so that, that reveals that the problem is the system that expects the yes or doesn't accept the no. Um, because what we found before wasn't a structure or culture that allowed for balance. We found the, the little workarounds that unfortunately COVID has exposed don't work for us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, and so the number of people I know who even within furloughs or people not being able to do, you know, gigs or perform or not selling music or whatever, right? We are working so much more now because we don't have the workarounds available to us that we found to make this untenable system a little more livable. Yeah. yeah. We're having to find, learn entirely new platforms and technologies and work around the limitations of not being able to afford the actual technologies that would allow us to do our job better and mm -hmm. to the our ability. And we're getting asked by conferences to do things for free under these conditions. And how is that just or fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of different platforms though, let's talk about social media and boundaries. Ew. <laughs> Thank you for saving that. For have, thank you for saving that for when we have ten minutes left. I'm sure we'll cover it. In You're welcome. <laughs> it's, that's a real thing. I think for me, that's a lot of that's a big part of the. You know, used used to have that twenty minutes in the car to drive home, and at least I was like not looking at a screen then. But now, like, my computer's right here, and my social media follows me on my phone and on my watch, and it's like it never should. Not, social media is not a nine to five. <laughs> And, you know, what are my responsibilities to social media or when can I turn that off and not feel like I'm going to wake up to a firestorm in the morning if I don't monitor this all night? Yeah. I will say you can walk away 
Thank you. <laughs> you, get to do you. You get to do you. Um, just as a rule. Um, there are also moments of responsibility, moral, and to communities um, and pain that certain leadership has. You know, a friend of mine said once, you don't have to respond to everything. <laughs> and I have found that helpful. There have been many times I've seen things that um, I agree with and I might just like without a comment. Mm -hmm. Other things I don't agree with and I don't comment at all because it, I don't want to take the time or the energy to involve to involve myself in something that's Again, it's not going to be life giving. <laughs> and some people are not going to hear your point of view, no matter what you say. So it, we just move on. I love that you mentioned that, Roger, because I think personally, too, that's kind of been my mantra. It's like, oh, my gosh, do you even get involved here or not? Is like. Does this is this also someone who I'm in relationship with or who I like? expect like wants to know or to grow or to do better so like giving them the benefit of the doubt to do that I don't always know the person that well or um or I do know that it's not going to go somewhere um or be heard and so I I that's kind of how personally I make my social media boundaries so when I do say something especially dissenting it's out of love um yeah, yeah i think that, that rings true um especially because putting it in the perspective of um you know you don't neither of you are, are out there just commenting on everything um and so when you do comment i pay attention because you took the time to thoughtfully put together something to say. And you don't always do that. You do it when you find it to be important and something you feel called to do. And that like makes it more special to me. Like it makes it like, I gotta pay, I gotta tune in because this is, this is obviously important to him or her. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think maybe we're even seeing like a new way of even interpreting or using social media as a tool in that way. Um, I'm not going to engage in everything, but when I think it's important, here I am. And I, I think there, there are, you know, two, two additional things with that. That And so we just announced the other day um, our schedule for next week's conversations, which is week three. In week four, which now I feel tired even saying week four. In week, <laughs> in week four, um, we have a, a conversation scheduled to talk about uh, just generational differences and how understanding some of the realities of generational differences and the best research of under generational differences can help sometimes interpret situations that seem otherwise difficult to understand because obviously we all look at through our own generational lens. But there is something to be said, you know, about what you mentioned, Bex, and this can be difficult to understand for others at sometimes that, you know, different generations do use communi communication signifies something different. For different people, and oftentimes um, it can. It, there's a different cultural reality or expectation where it might have been the, you know, you say something, keeping up appearances of relationship, etc. That's a different generational reality. The if I am engaging with you, it means I care, even if that's a hard thing to say. That's a whole other communication reality that oftentimes comes through that generational lens, which I think is fascinating. But also when it comes to messaging and speaking, and I think we're seeing this in 2020 as well, saying when you say, just like we mentioned before, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, right? When you say yes to speaking, you're saying no to not speaking. Well, you know, when you say no to, you know, there's, and I don't want to oversimplify that, right? But I think sometimes to understand what goes into people's calculations, there's both the yes and the no um, aspect to that as well, you know? Um, we have only, because I was reminded that in the session on boundaries, we should at least end at the time that we advertised, you know, instead of going further. Um, we also, we only have a, a few minutes left. I mean, I, I know that there are so many more things that we can talk about and we've barely scratched the surface on this, but one of the, um, 
things maybe if I could do this, and I don't want to put any of our panelists on the spot. So I'll introduce the question. I'll give our final wrap up information and then I'll come back for your response. But this has been a rich conversation that's touched on so many different things, right? So, um, so for, for Bex, Roger, Kate, if before we go, if we could kind of um, give our final thought in terms of in our ongoing discernment and our ongoing consideration of this big topic, what are we gonna take from this conversation as we go forward to continue to discern? So I'd love to hear your reaction to that, right? So chew on that for a second. For everyone who's joining us live, as a reminder that again, we've recorded this, we're gonna rebroadcast this conversation likely tomorrow morning, both on Facebook and through YouTube. So if you would like to watch this again, you know someone else who might benefit from viewing this, please um, encourage them to watch. We'll send you a follow-up email with links, with other resources, more information about the work of both Bex and Roger. Um, so that'll be coming later tonight or tomorrow morning. And uh, so please feel free to share that with other people as well. We we do have more conversations, a, a conversation you do not want to miss tomorrow about power, accountability. Um, as we look at moving beyond safe environment, you're going to want to be there for that. Next week, we have a full slate. And as I mentioned, we have week four and five coming up yet. Oh my God, say a prayer. Um, we, have a, we have a marathon yet to run. So, um, so all of that being said, um, Bex, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot as we've you know, talked for the last hour or so, what's gonna stick with you? What are you taking away from the conversation? It's a great question. There's so much to take away. I think personally, I'm taking away to not just stop at boundaries, um, personal, but to also think more and have more conversations with those I work with, especially in ministry, about what systems we can create um, that that just help facilitate a safe place for people to um, to assert boundaries. Great, Roger. I think it is important, uh, especially as Catholics. You know, there's this thing about Catholic guilt, but not to feel guilty about saying no that no, Jesus said to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But how can you love others if you don't first love yourself? So saying no is in some ways, at least a form of self love. And do not feel guilty about saying no. Thought, and I, I, to use your word, Matt, thoughtfully, to thoughtfully say no. Um, because you are important too. You cannot do effective ministry if you have nothing to give. So it's okay to say no and not feel guilty about it. Kate? Yeah, I'm thinking of um, actually one of the people who offered a comment here, um, gave a perspective on uh, the Magnificat as being Mary's great song of yes, but also a lot of no's. And in that, I feel like they're, you know, I'm working on, my own little theology of um, the, the, the sacredness of the word no and our need to you know, develop a, a, a respect around that. And then I had two practical suggestions for people that have helped me, um, which is if this is about a boundary in your work, go back to your job description. And if what you're being asked to do is not in your job description, maybe don't do it. Also look for that little fine print that says, and other duties as assigned and get really curious about that and ask more questions about what that is gonna look like for you. And the other one is that if you haven't already found it, the thing that has brought me a lot of peace is the do not disturb function on my phone. <laughs> I, um, I thank you. Thank you for that and, and for the, the practical considerations. I, you know, as, as Lena Gokelman put in the comments earlier, you know, no is a complete you know, sentence, you know, if you want it to be, right? It is, no is, is there. And I think that sacredness of no is great. For me, I'm going to take away back to your, your concept of, you know, saying no, setting these boundaries is an act of radical justice. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the need for me to be a better agent of, of that radical, you know, justice. So um, 
again, thank you all so much. We like all of our conversations, we could be here for days still talking about this and still needing needing to um, do more processing. So Roger, Bex, Kate, thank you all so much for bringing your perspective and being so generous with your time. All of you who joined us, thank you. Those of you watching this um, on the, the recording, thank you for viewing this. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, and we hope you join us for another summer series session really soon. So thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.